I absolutely still remember how it was to see the first painting by Hilma of Klin, actually to encounter the first painting. I couldn't explain to myself. It was weird and beautiful and strange and otherworldly. I remember I left the museum with a mixture of joy and anger. Joy because I had encountered this beautiful artist and anger because I thought, how is it possible that I have studied art history, that I have been writing for a newspaper for years on arts and that I would not know this artist. One of the most persistent myths about Hilma Eif Klint, I think, is the idea that her paintings were secret, that she did not want to exhibit them during lifetime and that she didn't exhibit them. Actually, we now know that this is not true. Um, there are a lot of traces and evidence in her notebooks that she wanted to exhibit them. Um, and we also know that she did. So in 1913, she participated for the first time in, her, in a group show in order to show her spiritual paintings. There's another exhibition in 1928 in London, where she participated in a show organized by the anthroposophists. Most of the time she was actually busy trying to organize that people could see her paintings, but believed sort of in the future, in the next generation, that they would be more open to her work, which they were. Science is very important to Hilma Af Klint, and I think it goes back a long time in her life. She came from a family of Navy officers so, and cartographers, so her family was involved in making the invisible visible when they charted the waters. Um, and she, in a way, drew a parallel to that because she was also making the invisible visible, but it was the spiritual realm that she would make. And then we should not forget that also Stockholm was a center of scientific debate. All these new findings in science promoted a view of the world basically saying that everything can change. So evolution is the idea that every organism can change. Uh, radioactivity is also the idea that elements can change and also that atoms are not fixed, but atoms can also change and can split. And she did two series that are very directly connected to these discoveries. So there's one series of 1908 called Evolution, and then there is a later series of 1917, which is called Atom. And there she follows precisely that, namely sort of the change in all sort of levels of matter. And she would push it forward to say, there's evolution of organic matter, but this evolution doesn't stop in matter, but actually it can change matter into spirit. I think all of Hilma Afklin's art, if we try to put it under a big umbrella, is about connecting. The idea that we need to connect with the lively spirit that exists in everything. There are a lot of dualism she tried to overcome. The first one to start with would be um, spirit and matter. The other dualism which is very important to her is the dualism of male and female. She believed that every person has male and female personas and that you connect, need to connect with all these people. And then think of a beautiful um, spiritual and botany, which she develops in the late, or let's say around 1920. Um, there the idea is that we need to connect with, the, uh, with nature, with flowers, with plants, and that also they have a soul. And in understanding that, we can connect with the soul of a flower and it can enrich our being. The temple is a very fascinating project in Hilma Afklin's uh, work. So she starts out with these amazing paintings, almost 200, um, and they get the title Paintings for the Temple. And then much later, she starts to design 
uh, an actual temple that she wanted to be built on the island of Wien, which is in between Den Sweden and Denmark. So she sketched this temple several times in her notebooks. Um, I guess an architect would say it's not a very clear vision, but in general you have a vision of how it would look. So it would be um, circular in shape and then you would walk up um, in spirals um, to the top. On, on, on the top there would be a tower that would open up to an observatory in order to observe the stars. The idea was that it would be a place where people could go um, and study. So the idea was also to have a library, the idea was to have a garden, and it would be a meeting center, um, a place for studying, um, a center for a spiritual turn maybe. And I think what she dreamt of was really to have her own Goetheanum, her own Donach, sort of, in her way. What she did doesn't resemble anything anyone else was doing in her life. So um, people back then, I think, were baffled and uh, provoked and angry because it was nothing they had seen before. And I think for us, we have the feeling we know abstract art, we immediately see that she has a very own conception of it. But I think we value abstract art, uh, we have learned to, um, to handle it. Back then, if people were religious, they were religious in a kind of confessional sense, they would go to a church and believe sort of everything the church would say. Nowadays, I think people um, from all different backgrounds are interested in having uh, spiritual experiences, but they accept that there are many ways to have them. Some would do yoga, some would sort of read uh, alchemist books from old times and so forth. So I think people are much more open to deal with a person that talks about these issues than they were in her lifetime. Um, and I think we are just at the beginning of understanding what she was interested in and what's there in her painting. I mean, her paintings are so dense and challenging that we can, each of us could spend a lifetime um, studying them. And I think the more people are interested, the more research will be done, the more connections will be made, the bigger will be the cosmos of Hilma of Klins. And I think this is a wonderful movement and this universe will certainly expand over ne the next years.